We're going to turn once more to AI um, in, a, in a different context. Uh, Professor Jason Manili um, from the Department of Interior Design recently won a national CETA award recognizing outstanding practice in design education. Specifically, he was involved with evidence-based design uh, pedagogy that incorporated AI. Uh, this video captures his creative philosophy and process of exploring inclusive design, not just from a code perspective, but how AI could be used as a tool to have students really dig deeper in what it means to um, really practice whole person design. So this is a seven minute video. So Jason will only be able to, to make a few comments, you know, about uh, his work, but please pay particular attention. Um, I wanted to call out the work of Ellen Straub, who is a, a graduate uh, of our program. And she worked at the undergraduate scholars program on an AI project uh, under Professor Manili's mentorship. That's really quite interesting. So, uh, I am going to, I think we were going to roll uh, the video and then uh, Jason will have time to make a comment or two and answer a few questions. My name is Jason Manili and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Interior Design at the University of Florida. I am here today to share with you some of the exciting things that I have been doing with virtual reality to engage my students in studio. When virtual reality headsets hit the market in 2016, I was eager to explore their potential role in design education. But to be honest, I also worried that VR could become a blindfold if left to its own devices. A whiz-bang environment that could easily distract my students from the very real consequences of their design decisions. I wanted VR headsets to become more than just the next cool way for my students to present a project. I needed to go deeper I needed to develop tools and strategies that connect the novelty of VR to the virtues of our discipline, to human-centered design, to experiential learning, and to evidence-based solutions. In this presentation, I will share three values-driven approaches I have developed to meaningfully employ VR in interior design education. My first strategy for VR, virtually place students into the shoes of others to better evaluate their in-process work. How would students change their evolving design solutions after visiting their space in a wheelchair, with low vision, or even as a child? I worked with some amazing student volunteers from UF's computer science program to develop and code virtual characters to inhabit the 3D files my students were already making in studio. We designed the wheelchair to use Oculus Rift touch controllers, which allowed students to grip the virtual wheels to propel and steer the chair. To increase authenticity, we made the wheelchair accelerate faster when students push harder and brake when they grip the wheels tighter. I did not want students to have to learn yet another software application. Instead, students worked with 3D modeling software they were already familiar with. They simply export their project in FBX format, launch the application we created in Unity, choose the character they want to be, and open their exported file to begin. Let's see the process in action. After the initial hype wore off, <laughs> this is the coolest thing. How did you do this? And a small learning curve. Ah! How do you stop? Students began to reflect on how they would modify their design solutions to better support wheelchair users. So yeah, obviously right off the bat, I noticed this sculptural piece in the middle is way too big. And if I had just walked in, it would block my view of the merchandise and the branding on the back wall. I think that with this, it's it would just be hard to see the glasses on the higher shelves because of the chairs are in the way I can't really back up enough to get a good look at them. And how high are you able to reach out of all your shelves? Mm, so I guess maybe just the third one if I really stretch. Now, now see how high you can reach. Yeah, still not all the way up. So how would that would that change anything? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess the, if the glasses were on the higher shelves, they wouldn't really be meant to be, I don't know, 
invest like looked at closely. It would just probably be more of a display thing. Mm -hmm. um, and was but that as, your original intent? Or? No, not really. Okay. So yeah, <laughs> that probably should change. Okay. Just move the whole thing down. Okay. It might oh. be hard getting in here. I can't get in there. Can yeah. You? Move it in. Oh, there's a there's an issue. That's that. yeah. Well, it's, it's amazing how long it took you to discover. I know. I didn't even think. I didn't try to do it. Yeah. No, I'm stuck. You're stuck right now. Yeah. So I can't even go by. So yeah, that's definitely. And those are hard to reach. This is a little claustrophobic back here for wheelchairs. Didn't really think of that. Yeah, that's really hard to grab up there. I probably could have put some shorter or smaller tables because obviously, like, this kind of feels. Oh, it's kind of sad because, like, obviously I can't really access the bar area. I could not have been more pleased with the learning outcomes. My students were designing beyond accessibility codes to address a more holistic end-user experience that included physical reach, social inclusion, sight lines, and safety. The learning was truly transformative. Student awareness, self-observation, and self-reflection were greatly enhanced. Because I think when I'm designing, I'm only looking at the floor plan and I'm just making sure I have three feet around everything. And I'm not thinking about the vertical side of things and like reaching and, you know, looking around at things and how that would affect your uh, point of view. For my next steps, I am now ready for students to employ a series of low vision characters that simulate everything from cataracts and macular degeneration to glaucoma and color blindness. The severity level of each condition can be adjusted with sliders so students can evaluate a range of color and contrast relationships that can impact safety. My second strategy employed VR to immerse students into experiential case studies of cutting edge interior spaces. For example, I was invited by ASID to create a virtual tour of their DC headquarters. Since the space is well building certified, I wanted students to drill down deeper into the design principles operating under the hood. So I ensured that learning content was integrated into every room of the tour. Students can access a floor plan to teleport around the space and are encouraged to click floating information icons to learn more about the design. I have made seven immersive case studies to date, which are great for virtual field trips during lecture and is an online resource for students. Using virtual reality to conduct research in environments that have yet to be built is compelling. While my students quickly collected valuable data with the virtual characters, we must be extra careful of the assumptions we make. While some things translate well between virtual and real worlds, some things never will. The tactility of material, the comfort of a chair, or the multi-sensory experience of space. For my third strategy, I am conducting experimental research to map out the limitations of VR for simulating reality. Where can we safely employ VR for research and where is it best avoided? By comparing differences in human perception between real and virtual worlds, we can maximize the validity of using VR to research the built environment. I hope you have enjoyed seeing this work as much as I have enjoyed seeing it come to life. As technology continues to change the way we work, we must ensure it does not alter why we work. If we do not assert our values over technology, technology will surely assert itself over us. We must work hard as an educational community to keep our eyes open and our blindfolds off. Jason, uh, uh, talk to us a little bit. <clears throat> Jason, uh, I love the way you finish this and it um, really shows that uh, really sort of seamlessness that you're trying to achieve between your research and your teaching. Um, what do you see as um, some of the next steps in this work? Uh, so right now what I've been doing is uh, working with um, some graduate students to really start to validate where we can employ this in research because I think VR is, has great potential for us to, to simulate certain aspects of reality, but things might not translate. So for example, we just conducted a study looking at um, luminance and brightness within within um, architectural lighting simulations to see how far could we conduct lighting research. 
And one of the interesting things is if you, if you take the brightness of a typical interior space um, and compare it to the amount of brightness that a virtual headset will give you, the virtual headsets are 10 time, or 15 times dimmer than the, re the real space. However, what we found is given time for the human uh, visual system to, to adapt to lighting, we actually found no perceived differences in brightness. However, that would work for perceptual studies, but we probably couldn't reliably look at task illumination um, within that type of environment. And so what that sort of tells me is where we can start using this in, in um, other things. The other thing we've also found is we looked at issues of visual acuity. We gave students uh, reading tasks in real world and simulated environments. And what we find within VR is that visual acuity is very low and very poor uh, right now. And so really limiting the research to more large scale macro tasks is going to be more reliable than if we start getting down to micro scale tasks. So really trying to map out where VR can be appropriately used is kind of where we're taking this next. Um, also, I'm trying to think of other characters. We're looking at doing a child simulator where we can put in the length of your own arm and translate that motion to where you only have the reach of a ch child. So just looking at how many different ways we can start looking at space is kind of where we are going next. But doing that with validity, I think is what's important. Yeah. Sure. I have one one more question before I call uh, time on this. As you know, all of our lives have been uh, transformed, uh, particularly with how we interact with one another, how we view space, um, trying to establish the tension between trying to establish um, a sort of, we want to be in safe environments, but we're hardwired to want community and this lifestyle is not sustainable forever. So uh, do you think that um, living in, um, within the pandemic and post pandemic, how do you think that this research could start answering some of those questions on how we can negotiate um, this, this shift in perception and the way that people are wanting uh, and feel comfortable about being in interior spaces? That's a good question. I guess part of my drive for conducting this research is that when new technology comes out our eyes immediately get wide and we all talk about the possibilities of technology oh look this is look at all the barriers it undoes but i'm a big proponent to say well what are the new barriers it brings along with it and so in some ways i think one of the most positive things that's possibly come out of the pandemic is people ha have realized that that connection in that broad sense does not equal meaningful connection. And, and so for me, that's, that's really where things start to, to happen. Like just even in my own Zoom uh, meetings, just kind of questioning where does interaction really happen well with students? And it tends to be in the large, the smaller breakout groups when we're only six to seven people. That's where people just let loose and kind of become themselves and conversations become natural. Um, I've also noticed, and this is something I share with people, just trying to think of these things from a, from a humanistic standpoint. Uh, the difference between getting that Zoom intensity where you're leaning into your screen and you just feel worn out versus like kicking your feet back, leaning back in your chair and just starting to know that you can dialogue in, in, in very casual manners. And so I, I think that... I, I don't see technology as a panacea for things. I just see it as yet another option, but that if we don't socially position ourselves within it, we're, we're doomed to fail, that we're gonna technologically develop, but we're not gonna developmentally develop as people. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing your work. I think it really drives home that important um, What's so important to bring in mind is that their values and their ethics and in, in the decisions that we make, you know, as designers, we know this technology is, um, has so much promise, but it's not a panacea. And, and I feel like there is this holistic interconnection between 
um, what you're doing as a researcher and what's happening in this studio. So I felt like that was really important to put under the spotlight and, and wrap us up for today. So thank you, Jason. Well, thank you. I appreciate it.